So, hello, my name is Del Cutting, and I run Sound Cuts Limited, which is a games audio outsourcing company. Well, I just I just started working in film because I went to the NFTS, and uh, I got my first job in film. And the then head of music, at, well, head of audio at EA, contacted the NFTS and said, did they have any students who um, were interested in animation? Because uh, they wanted to uh, track like the cutscenes in the darkening. And uh, I loved animation. That was what I really loved at film school. Uh, that's what I did most work on was the animations because I loved the fact there was no sound. You had to create everything. Uh, so even though I'd left film school at that point, the head of uh, audio at the film school remembered that that's what I really loved and contacted me to see if it's something I'd be interested in. And to be honest, I hadn't really played any game. I played Lemmings and things like that, but I wasn't really a gamer. And uh, so I had no idea what to expect, but I thought I'll go down and, and see see what's happening. And I was amazed because I turned up and they had a, an amazing studio. All the sound designers had great kit, you know, Pro Tools. And I thought, well, they're exactly the same tools as I use, you know, and it wasn't what I was expecting at all. So I thought, yeah, I'd love to have a go at this. So then I worked uh, on those bits and pieces they needed me. I think it was wasn't long, it was only a three month contract. And then I went back to films and then they contacted me again and uh, said, we've got a full time position. And I was like, you know, those jobs don't really come up in film, full time jobs. And it's like, yes, I could do with that. So uh, yeah, I did it. And uh, it was great because I think I started just at the right time because uh, we were just going into the PlayStation 1, uh, the audio team who was there, there was um, Chris Nichols was head of department, there was Nick Laviers, uh, he was then the audio programmer, although, you know, he does do sound design, in fact, he's a, an audio director himself, uh, a guy called Bill Lusty and James Hannigan was the composer, so I was the first sound designer they hired, and uh, it was just a fantastic team, because at that point, uh, there wasn't a focus on audio, and so the audio team were the people deciding what they were going to do and how they were going to do it. And it was before things like WIs and FMOD, and there weren't any tools. Uh, and Nick had a great idea, you know, for a tool he'd like to write. And I was like, oh, well, wouldn't it be great if we could do that? He goes, yes, I've already thought of that. And it was just brilliant. It just felt like I'd arrived just at the moment when everything was being developed and it was just really exciting to be part of it. And just a really good bunch of guys. And it was fantastic because, you know, like James, James Hannigan's, awesome you know and he was like the in-house composer and we could work together and look at sequences and he'd say that's uh, I really want to do this but section with music and I was able to say oh well I want to make this a sound effects moment and you know it was great to have that because you certainly don't get that in film where you get to talk with the composer and decide things I mean ultimately in film it's the director who makes those calls so it just felt really accessible in a team and the audio people driving it you know and People weren't really, the rest of the team didn't seem to, you know, as long as it sounded good once it was in, they, you know, the focus wasn't on us, you know. And then obviously that team expanded and we got, you know, good things said about our stuff, you know. And then that's when everybody started focusing on it. <laughs> and, you know, obviously things changed then. I mean, definitely since starting Sound Cuts, um, we've done, I've done obviously corporate you know, corporate trailers and videos, and I've done a lot of branding and uh, movie company logos. So if you go to the cinema, there's AI films, that's our, well, my sound. And uh, then, yeah, we're doing a cartoon series for Cartoon Network, and we do the, all the Nickelodeon shorts. So, well, I'd say sound for games is a lot harder. Um, I'm quite a visual person, so I find it very hard the old school way was you'd get sent a list of sound effects and they'd say car rev one, car rev two. And, and uh, I, I find that really, I find it really difficult to work like that. I like to actually see it because when I see something, I hear in my head what I want it to sound like. I can almost, it sounds a bit silly, but I can hear the soundtrack and uh, then it's my job to sort of like recreate that. So when I'm working in games, I still like to start from that point where I see something and I almost design it like you would a linear piece of media. Um, but then you obviously have to work out what need, what's going to happen a lot, what's interactive, how are you going to, how are you going to program that? So for me, I definitely work from the top down. So I 
imagine it as a film and then break it up into the separate elements and make it into make that interactive um whereas i do know other people have, who are very technically driven tend to start the other way around and build it up but i'm very much a top-down person and that's probably my my training as well and i i think sometimes i mean we've got great stuff now which is needed like wis and fmod and all the stuff that that can that can give you but i do think it could be people want to use all the buttons and i think sometimes to get a really good soundtrack you have to concentrate on, on the end result. So sometimes focusing on that first and then working out how to get to it is sometimes, well, for me, works better than here's a granular synthesis plugin. I must use that. That's a great bit of tech. Shove it in there, you know. So that's that's my working. But yeah, games is a lot harder. There's a lot more things to think about, you know, repetition. You know, somebody can stay in a loop for ages. How do you make it not boring? You know, so yeah, a lot harder. With, with film, you've got the director who's in charge of everything and you've got the sound supervisor, but the sound supervisor isn't in charge of music, they're dialogues and, and sound effects. I mean, obviously, you'll get teams who do work very closely together, but every, it's the director who's the conduit, you know, collects everybody's ideas and basically focuses everybody. In, well, it's his project, it's his main idea. Whereas in games, it's the audio director who, who owns everything to do with audio the speech, the music, the sound effects. And I think that's, for me, why I really love it. I'm a megalomaniac. No, but that's why I, yeah, I just think they all need to fit together. And I'd find it frustrating if I was working on a project and you didn't have any any input into the music, you know. And I like working with composers and sort of like, sort of like telling them what my ideas are and just getting their feedback. I, I do I think I'm a people person, but I do like... I like having lots of people talking about it and trying to work together as a team to actually get to the end result. Uh, yeah, I like to get um, style guides together. You know, sort of like, well, first of all, you'll talk a lot to the creative director and the project and the lead. And I'm quite visually led. So as soon as I see what, what the art's doing, I think that clearly leads you. To, to a conclusion what you want to do with the sound effects. Um, I think you work with some creative directors who really have a, have a clear idea what they want. And then it's making sure that you're on the same page with them and bringing all their ideas into it, but also developing them to think of new ideas that they hadn't thought of. Um, but yeah, very visually led. And uh, yeah, I love getting style guides together where you can, um, quite often to be fair, it's, it comes together quite quickly. As soon as you see the visuals, it's it's really clear, or you know the game idea, you you know it. But there are, are a few, like on one project I did recently, I did sort of like there was two ways we could have gone. So I got one movie and I track laid it very quickly with two different ways we could approach it, um, and then from that you could bring in other ideas that you could have for different types of music within that style, but you know sort of like branching out. Um, but yeah, I definitely think. As soon as you know the style, it needs to be solidified somehow. I mean, yeah, they're, they're very good with their pre-production process. And uh, so you would have whole movies dedicated to sort of like what it's going to look like and sound like. Um, and I think that's one thing I've definitely taken with me is having this whole, there's a pre -vis, And it's nice to, even if during the game the, the direction changes or moves on, I think it's good to always keep that and keep referencing back to it. Because sometimes... You know, some of these projects go on a very long time, like two years, and you can just be so in it, you you forget where you're going. And so it's nice to have this package that you did at the start to reference, because sometimes like, yes, that's what we were meant to do with it, right? No, let's let's refocus. No, I think uh, at the start of every project, I think, oh, no, I can't do it, <laughs> which sounds silly. But I do, I do... Um, and then you get into it and you can do it. But um, I remember recently, you know, obviously uh, now I'm freelance, you know, you have to go in and sort of like introduce yourself and there's several other people who are all in, you know, you know that you're against other people who are going to be, you know, wanting the job too. And uh, I got the gig and uh, I, said, I turned around to my husband and I went, oh, no, I got it. He goes, why are you saying it now? I said, I can't do it. I can't do it. He goes, of course you can. I said, I can't, I can't, I can't do zombie noises. 
He goes, of course you can do zombie noises. But I do have this panic. Um, but yeah, then you start and you start pulling in ideas and yeah, you, you, it comes together. You know, and I think also because I'm, I work top down, um, I think it, it would also panic me if I thought, how on earth am I going to integrate this first of all? So, yeah, I definitely focus on getting the, the sound and getting that right. Because I think if I thought about the sound on the tech, then, you know, I'd never get out of bed and I'd just be a, a worried wreck. But no, I always get that first fear of, I can't do it. For quite a lot of the projects, we'll have WIs and we'll be able to integrate it into WIs. Um, quite often we'll get a build on the game. It depends, again, it depends which company you're working for as to how security conscious there are. Uh, for a lot of the smaller games, they just want us to chuck them sounds, which personally I don't like because you can do really, you can be the best sound designer in the world. But if you don't have any say on how they're implemented, then it's not going to sound right. And uh, so, I don't like that and I really do want to be involved and when I go into companies I say we're not this external team we're your audio department you've got to see us as part of your team we're not just people who you don't see we're the people who are you know we're part of your team you've got to talk to us you know we're we're, we're not just uh, an outsourcer we're not you know I, I think especially especially the way uh in a company in a when I've worked for larger companies and uh, they did get quite a lot of outsourcing done uh, somewhere else, um, like art outsourcing, uh, you'll hear the artist like, oh, you know, when it comes back in, it's sort of like picking at it. And I didn't want that to happen. I don't want people to, to, oh, let's see what the outsourcers did. I want them to feel that we're part of their team. You know, the same way as if you're, if you're a big team of internal sound designers, when somebody gives you work, you don't want them to, you don't want the work to be bad so you can pick at it. You want it to be good, you know, and, and I think that's the way I want people to see us, you know, we're part of your team. And I've completely forgotten the question. What was the it's question? Implementation oh, yeah. So, yeah. So in a nutshell, yeah, I think it's really important as an outsourcer that you're, that you're in. I'll start that again. I just think... Uh, as an outsourcer, for me, it's really important that you actually go into the company and see what your sounds like sound and game. Gosh, there's hardly any memory space. When, when I went from being the girl who did the cutscenes and the linear stuff, um, I was asked to do an interactive sequence. They showed me this explosion and it must have lasted about 10, 15 seconds. So I got on Pro Tools and I designed this sound extravaganza that lasted, well, the same length as the explosion and I gave it to my boss he said we can't use this he goes there's no space for it I said but that's how long it is he goes no you can only have a one second sound I said yeah but the explosions 12 seconds I don't understand and he said well basically everything you've just done in your track in your Pro Tools track lay you have to do that but within code so it was like taking this one sound but then you know pitch shifting pitch shifting it down so there was like a long longer continual one and then adding delays and pitches and all the pitch shifting and all the others and fading in so that you basically recreated this whole sequence just with one so I mean for me that was but it, it did blow me away because I thought God, I hadn't even thought of that so yeah it was always memory in those days it was always memory and the amount of streams you had to use because I think it was just basically music speech in fact i don't know if speech was in memory actually but it was no speech would have had to have been streamed because there's no memory but it was it was it blew my mind then how great these games sounded when my eyes were opened up to how little space people had you know so yeah that was the biggest challenge i think it's more widely known now but i think a lot of people were doing it back then I think a lot of people if you've been training a, that's what I'm saying about the top down thing because if you did the top down you could think about all those little fun bits all the bits that would make people laugh and then accommodate for them rather than do it up and then add these sort of like sound triggers I mean I think they were being done from a really early stage I mean I didn't work on it but Resident Evil you know you could hear the blood dripping before you see it so people were already using sound as a narrative device pretty early on but yeah I mean now you can get tons of stuff in so you can get 
loads of tricks and, uh, you know, things. I'm trying to think of a funny trick we use now. Oh, one of the things we did do, which was really cool, uh, which was in one of the Harry Potter games, there was an Urkling. And uh, it had a specific bit of... We did, on this Potter project, actually, it, we'd had lots of brainstorming sessions because we were getting new characters that J.K. Rowling had given us, but we were allowed to flesh them out. And this... Ca- I love the Urkling. <laughs> Basically, he was like a, a bit like a child catch. He was sort of like very spindly and uh, like a man made of sticks he was sort of like in the forest uh, how can you make him into a child catcher maybe he'll play a flute maybe he'll sing so uh jeremy soul did the did the soundtrack for that and uh did a beautiful melody and we got that and then we we copied it in sort of like a really in fact it was me playing it it was like a wooden bamboo flute and i just played it so it sounded so it had the same melody but played it badly because of well, it fit the character, to be quite honest. And then uh, the voice actor who did it actually sang it and we got some lyrics written and he sang the tune. And so basically, whenever you went into areas with uh, the Urkling, you'd hear the orchestra sort of like bringing in a really sort of like spooky version of it until it was well established in the game. And then obviously when we'd established it and the players knew when they heard the music, they'd see the Urkling. We started throwing it in when there wasn't an Urkling just to catch them out. And that was a, an audio trick that I thought was really funny to be able to scare kids. Yeah. Actually, and uh, my I had to tone down my sound effects in Harry Potter, which was great because they were deemed too scary for the uh, age rating on the game. It's it's not just me now. There's there's five of us who, who work at Sound Cuts, and uh, I'd say most of the time it's pretty early on. You know, there's it depends really. Um, so like there's I'm working up with a couple of Sony X Dub Studios, and I was pretty much brought on board right at the outset to actually start developing the audio direction and to work with them and to you know sort of like bring in music ideas and sound design styles and to do all their you know, presentation material to help the project get progressed through the Sony Sony gates and what have you. So they're quite early on. I'd say um, some of the the smaller games, like slot games and iOS games, that's they. I still have to do a lot of educating with them because I will get the list, and it's like, no, no, we don't do lists. Um, you know, but we've done a lot of work with them, and now they actually send us the game, and you know, they'll send us this is what we'd like. But we say, yeah, we can deliver that. But actually, what else you need is X, Y, and Z, you know, and or have you tried this? You know, so I think it obviously depends. When you first start working with somebody, you've got to assess your relationship with them. And, and then when you form a relationship, then you can actually say, right, if you really want great audio, let's try it like this, you know, and you sort of like help them work with you. And I think that's a really good way with working. So actually, those companies now do come to us a lot earlier on. Um, which is great because you do need to be on board, first of all. But, yeah, no, I've been very fortunate that a lot of the stuff has been really, really early doors, actually. Well, obviously, we were linked to the film. So a lot of the key sound effects, like the Priori and Cantatum and creatures that appeared in the film, like Pixies, they had to sound the same in the game. And it was really tricky because the we had to get things ready on the game before the film was finished. So, you know, we'd need them sort of like in May, but yet the film wasn't going to be mixed until September or something. So we needed them really far in advance. Uh, so we did actually have to wait or sometimes we put in so for like the priori and cantatum i think it was that uh i actually got notes i can't remember if i spoke to randy tom i don't think so um but we got notes on what his thoughts were for what how he was going to do that spell so basically we designed something based on what he was saying he was going to do and then finally i think a week before we had one week left to get stuff in the game and we finally heard what it was going to sound like. Actually, we weren't that far away. Um, I think it was kind of hard because I don't think people understood that we couldn't just take the sounds from the film. You you can't send me what you track laid for the film and we'd just go, oh, thank you very much, Ed, just pop that in because, you know, that's not the way the, the sound's integrated in the game. You know, you couldn't even, 
you literally just could just listen to it and listen to the elements and then try to recreate those elements and mix it into the interactive content that you needed. But I think people are always quite surprised because I mean, we did get the Pro Tools sessions uh, for some of the things, you know, which was fantastic, but you couldn't, you couldn't lift them. You know, you had to redesign absolutely everything to sound like what they did. So it was, yeah, it was tricky, but it was really good. And it was nice when you got things close and like, yes. You know, I so I think quite with that one, we were really close. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I've forgotten yeah. what the question was. <laughs> no, exactly what, what was, you know, I guess your relationship with the film and how you dealt with it. You're yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, it would have, uh, it was quite, I think in the early days, it was uh, definitely in the very first film that was Eddie Joseph who was the sound supervisor on that and we knew him really well so he used to come into the offices so we had a very close relationship but then later on through the franchise um, as obviously things got very uh, security conscious um, everything had to go through Warners so we'd have to ask Warners for reference and they'd ask the film you know so we were waiting quite a long time for, for feedback but we got there in the end. I think the, the challenge, I mean, especially for me at the moment, I'd say the challenge was there's millions of challenges because there's so many different things a game can be released on. You know, mobile has a completely different set of challenges to a PlayStation 4 game, you know, to an Xbox One game too. You know, there's, there's so many different types. I mean, if you're on one and it's being shipped on various different consoles and platforms, you know, it's... It's incredibly difficult. So I have to say for me personally, it's the fact that it's not, if we find a solution on one thing, there's still all these other things without a solution. Um, I mean, like we, we, you know, on Xbox One and PlayStation 4, you know, you could say, yeah, we've got all the memory space we need, you know, but now on those platforms, it's more creative challenges. You know, how are we going to make this sound the greatest? How is our mix going to be the best? Because, and, and for me personally, I think it's, it's also creating a style because you don't want your game, you know, if you, especially like in music, you want your game to stand out with different music so people can hear the music and they know instantly which game it is. Because I do think there's quite a lot of games out there now who, which have very similar music. And if you heard the music, you wouldn't be able to say, that's that game. It's like, well, it could be that one. Or it could be that one. I don't know, you know. So I... I think really it's getting a good style for your game. Uh, making sure that, I think, narrative, I still don't think games have really nailed uh, the, using sound enough to, to create the narrative, although things like The Last of Us, obviously excellent, and Charter 3, brilliant. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd say on the big games, it's things like that, and creating, creating something new, and actually doing something with the tech you can't do with a linear medium. I think that's what my focus are is on on large games, but then on the smaller games like the iPhone game, it's it's just making it high quality, incredibly fast, incredibly cheaply. Because uh, you know, I put the same amount. Well, everybody who I work with, we put exactly the same amount of effort in into a small game that's paying hardly any money as we do a big game that's got good money. Because really. Why should a small game with no budget sound rubbish? Because it's a small game with no no budget, do you know what I mean? So yeah, it's there's so many different there's so many different every day's filled with thousands of things. <laughs> yeah, the the term this is right now is hard. When I was at EA I had a lot more, as, as a senior audio director, it was right now. When I said it was right now, unless obviously the exec producer said, no, it's not right now. Um, but when you're freelance, it's, um, I think I, I stop designing when I believe it. Um, so I don't know. I think you can just tell when something works visually, when you believe it. If it's saying everything, if it's giving you the emotion you want to get, if it's, telling you the story that you, you're need, needing to get out. I think that's when I think it's it's good. But then at the same time, does anybody know when to stop? I mean, you can really fiddle with stuff for a long time and, 
you know, I'm working on a level at the moment and I was really pleased with it. I was really pleased with it. And I came back to it after about four months. I'm like, oh, now I'm going to change that. Now I'm going to change this. And, oh, I'm going to add something there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like, it's funny because my dad's an artist and he did this painting and uh, I loved it. I loved this painting. But a few years later, he took it down and he, start, he sort of like added something else to it. And then he took it down and he added something else. And now, to be honest, I don't really like the painting. I think it's spoiled. He should have just left it. So I'm, I'm always sort of like aware that you can do that with your sound. It's very tricky. I think as, as sound design being an art form, it's, it's hard when to know what, when to let go. But also being on the freelance side of things, you, you're also very deadline driven. So you do as much as you can to make it sound awesome. And then you've got to let it go. Uh, this was this was great actually because I'm uh, I keep banging on about how visually how I'm visually driven and uh, I worked on Audio Defense the audio only game uh, the zombie zombie shooter and uh, I mean that's like the holy grail for a sound designer isn't it an audio only game and uh, that was one actually that I said to my husband I can't do it I can't do it and I was working here with James Lockhart. And uh, I remember turning around to him saying, I can't do it, James. And he was just looking at me like, don't say that. Don't say that because we've got it now. And uh, yeah, no, that was it was weird because it took me a, quite a few, I'd say at least, I mean, it was a short turnaround. We had four weeks uh, to do all the sounds. And uh, it took me it took me a good couple of days, uh, probably even three days three days which is a lot a lot of time when you've only got four weeks um to get my head around it because uh, all these tricks and that I did like say you were making a giant sound I you know you sort of like learn over time sort of like tricks to make it feel weighty and heavy and um but when there's no giants foot falling it didn't work and it was like it it I really had to get my head around it that there was no visual clue to hang on with because I'm always sort of like a talking about how audio saves heart you know audio feels it I mean we do we are the glue that holds everything together and we fix things we make things look better by you know the animator hasn't had time to do this so we'll put a sound in so nobody notices because they'll think it's happening because they've heard it you know and we're always fixing things and if things feel too slow you can add audio and it speeds it up or you know you can add audio and make it feel slower but all of a sudden it's just you and and I found that game at the start very very difficult because you have to be so focused you there can't be any fat on your sounds it's just got to be the one thing that you need to hear and you can't mix in like a not that there were many explosions but say for an explosion you'd have a big boom you'd have sort of like some sub then you'd have the explosion and then you'd have sort of like debris layer one for big bits of debris debris layer two you know aftershock debris you know and all this and uh it's it's just too cluttered when that's you, you just need to really focus so yeah i'm I've, I've found myself chopping a lot of things out of the sound to get the focus on it and um I mean, there, there wasn't much budget either, but I decided to have a phony session because I felt it was so important that if, there, if there's only one sound going to be playing or if you could only sort of like focus on one thing at once, it had to be the right thing. So, yeah, I actually w went and did quite a lot of foley, although um, Glenn, who, who I did the session with, he called it speed foley because obviously there was it was my money. So I'm like you know, doing everything super quick, you know, bang, 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 yeah, that's great, click, 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 yeah, drag, 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 drag. Honestly, by the end of the session, sorry, you don't have to put this on camera, but by the end of the session, I looked disgusting because I'd been in sort of like sand pits and rubble pits and uh, I just hadn't stopped. I think Glenn said at one point, do you want a glass of water or five minutes? I'm like, no, no. And I had sweat coming down and my clothes were sticking to me and I got home and I hadn't seen myself and I sort of like walked up past the mirror in my house and I just thought, I can't believe I've been walking because it had all been dirt and then there was just rivulets of, you know, where sweat had been. Nice. <laughs> really, really, it was really exciting and it was just, uh, it was fantastic to work with James and uh, 
it, it, it was great. We had a bit of a love in, you know, because I've worked with James for quite a long time. Uh, so we can do, I don't know, I think our, we're, we're quite good at camouflaging whose is whose. So my, you can't tell that's, he did that sound and I did this sound. And uh, yeah, we were having a bit of a love in, like I'd send him my zombie zombie, and he'd go, well, that sounds great. And then he'd send me his and I'd go, no, that sounds great. So we did have a bit of a, bit of a love in. 